Thank you very much for having me at this meeting. It's one of my favorite meetings that I get to go to because it's really with the patients. And that was such a great story, but you'll notice how the, C how the cancer was found. CT scan, you know, CT scan, and that's how virtually every person who goes through the ER now gets a CT scan. It's become a really, I think, almost indispensable diagnostic test. And unfortunately, there is a serendipitous finding, but in this case, hopefully everything will go well. So um, I uh, work at uh, UNC also, and I work in abdominal imaging, which I uh, predominantly everything below the diaphragm and above the hips. I specialize in oncology, and particularly gynecology and urology. So I work in that area. And so how do I try and help out the doctors? Well, the first thing you're going to uh, see here is our uh, cancer board or tumor board. So almost every major hospital will have a multidisciplinary conference, and this brings all of the doctors together. So anyone who might be involved in uh, patient care together. And this includes the pathologists who look at the cells, and you saw from Dr. Kim, and it calls, including the radiologists who look at the cancers from that point of view. And all of these people get together, we get a consensus sort of agreement on how things are looking because we really learn from each other. And we also yell at each other sometimes <laughs> because not everything has a single answer. There are often multiple ways to deal with something. Oh, I think we have a picture of Dr. Kim right here <laughs> at conference. Um, and we have to go through that. And that way also, you don't have to run around to all different hospitals, right? You have one space and you get an opinion. Now, when you get the opinion, it's, you're going to go over it with your physician team. You're going to decide, do I like this? Do I not like this? But this gives you one place to go. And so um, if I had a tumor, I want to go someplace that has a multidisciplinary team. Okay. So the goals for this lecture are really to describe the use of radiology in uh, screening, staging and planning therapy, treatment, and follow-up. Because we're sort of involved in all of those areas. And you're a very, very organized audience, but uh, whenever I do a lecture, I always like to define what we're talking about. So tumor equals mass equals cancer to me in, in oncology. So we use these terms. You might see them in your radiology reports. So unless you know you have a benign disease, mass is always something to think about, right? Tumor, mass, cancer. An image is just a picture, right? Uh, CAT scans are CT scans. Those are the ones that you go through, you get the injection, and they only take like, I can do the whole body now in 19 seconds. So very, very fast. So that's a really fast thing. Regarding, um, people sometimes say they have an allergy to the dye that we use. It's, pretty, it's very uncommon now, and when people ask me what the death rate is from, the, um, from an allergy, it's the same as for penicillin. It's about one in 100,000. So you shouldn't be worried about it, unless you know you've had a serious reaction in the past. Um, then ultrasound is, I think, the easiest to undergo. No dye, no nothing. You get to sit on the table and have a massage, so that's good. Um, and then magnetic resonance imaging, that has the scariest name. We call it MRI, but it's also another tube, <laughs> and you get to lie in the tube, and uh, it takes longer and it, it sounds louder, and we still usually give you dye. Okay, why would I choose CT versus MRI? And we'll go a little bit more into that. But in general, all of the literature supports that we have previously supports CT scanning. So this goes back a long way, right? And so uh, we have many, many studies demonstrating exactly what each finding means. Now, during the last 10 years, which is as long as I think we've had good MR imaging, and it really changes almost every week, practically, um, I think you can use similar findings with MR. Uh, it's particularly useful for certain kinds of tumors, and also, of course, for the occasional patient who already has renal failure. MR is a great option because we still see a lot with patients with renal failure. So renal obviously equals kidney, and you also always going to want to get reformatted images. This is state of the art now; it should be everywhere. So uh, that's when all the axial pictures, little pictures, are stacked up on top of each other, and then we can cut it any way. So we can look from the front, which is a coronal, or from the side, okay, which is a sagittal. That's extremely helpful. So we get reformatted images on everyone. 
So this is the renal mass. Okay, so this person unfortunately had already had a kidney out because I noticed it was done for a right lower quadrant transplant. And so we take a look at the left kidney. I always tell people ultrasounds, you're allowed to use the, the labels because it it's all looks kind of gray. And this ovoid thing is the kidney, this whole ovoid thing. And then there's a dark thing in the middle of it. So the dark thing doesn't look like a cyst to me. It looks like it's going to be solid. And so it's actually a, a nice picture of um, a mass. So we're saying the word mass. I think it's most likely going to be a cancer. And then this person ended up getting an MRI. And I'll show you why in a moment. But a lot of, when we asked to say to the, when you, um, the last speaker said they want to see you from neck to pelvis, it's because we find this kind of stuff too. One, we want to see if there are any metastasis anywhere else, but also we want to see if there's any other disease going on. So in this patient, here's the cancer that we were looking at before. But you see how the aorta, which is the main aorta, main uh, supply to your body is split in half. That's called a, an aortic dissection. So there's blood supply comes from the front aspect to the left and from the posterior aspect to the right. So we need to be able to know where that blood is going to come from so that when you have your surgery, we know exactly what they're going to cut and where they're going to go, especially when they said the laparoscopic hand assisted. Remember that when you're using that type of surgery, the surgeons are going in through little tubes right, little, little tubes, and they're looking through the tubes, and I got to tell them in advance, whoa, that, that aorta is split. So we need to consider if it needs treatment before, after, and what we're going to do about it. And this is what the chest x-ray looked on this patient. So another thing that most people with renal cell carcinoma get at the very beginning is a chest x-ray. And this thing up here, you're looking kind of sticks out, right? This is the right shoulder and the left shoulder. This is the neck. And this is where the abdomen starts. There's the heart. And there's this thing. And that's the aorta. That's where the dissection or the split starts. So the aorta split in half very high up here and went down. So looking at all the pictures together, we now have a dissection, we would call it, that started at the top. We need to think about whether that needs to be uh, fixed before or after dealing with the kidney. Okay, and then we have the kidney lesion, and we know now which side the blood comes from. So sometimes people, we see lots and lots of, you know, pretty healthy baby boomers, but maybe they've got another disease we don't know about. And even though we get, there's a lot of discussion from Washington about imaging, and Lord knows I've been on the phone trying to get imaging agreed to in many, many cases. It is absolutely essential prior to surgery. And last year, because the government does things in such a wise way, we got what's called a haircut in imaging. We got a 50% reduction in payment for all readings and all hardware costs. Wham, across the board. So there obviously careful thought <laughs> occurred in that, and that's why we have to spend so much time on the phone. Right? The goal of insurance companies is not to make sure you're healthy. The goal of insurance companies right now is to make sure they're making money for their stockholders. And also, the government is not really a thoughtful group right now, and everything is changing all the time. So I would also advise to all these other things that you get an advocate for yourself in the financial realm, too, and that you make sure what, how things are going to go and ahead of time. And I think that there's usually a financial services person at the hospital. You may also want to network and talk with other people who have been through it because you don't want to get a $10,000 bill if it could have been handled earlier. I know you're scared. I know things are rough. But the last thing you're going to need is a $10,000 bill when you've got things to do. So make sure you know what's going to happen. But literally, we took the haircut, as we said last year, and we have not decreased our services at all. But that's, you know, that's not going to happen forever. So we'll have to see how that works out. OK, renal cell carcinoma. Everybody's telling you, OK, there's so many of them. What's going on? I don't know. Some of them are increasing for some reason, maybe in our environment. But a lot of it is that everybody gets a CT scan. And it turns out I find one centimeter or two centimeter tiny CT, tiny renal cell carcinomas all the time. And then there comes up later on, which is the whole team's decision out there, what to do about it. Some people like choose to hang out with it. Some people say, ooh, it's cancer. I want it out of me. And some people are sort of in between. They'll watch it for a little while. 
And there are some uh, rules and guidelines, but this is the case where you're making the decision on this. The final call will be yours. And so uh, it's good to know what the guidelines are. And your physicians can go over that with you. And that's why I advise having the team approach with high quality physicians who do this all the time because they will know what the current guidelines are. So is there a screening test for kidney cancer? No, I don't have the silver bullet. You know, and there are some that are coming up now um, in imaging. We're finally there where we're doing molecular imaging. And Dr. Rathmel and I have done some work combining uh, some of the medications with some findings on there. But ultrasound or CT, we do those patients with the genetic disorders, like we talked about, von Hippel-Lindau and other family syndromes. We're going to be screening those people, so we're going to see that. And overall, ultrasound is great for detection, so a lot of people will have that early on. Remember we saw the black thing? Usually you can see it. But CT is good for treatment planning. So you'll probably have those along the way. How is CT done? You've all had this, okay? Every place is kind of different, but I usually obtain three sets of pictures. Um, the first two sets are basically used to determine the cancer. How vascular is it versus how not, how other things. And then finally, when I stack them all together, I talked about making reformats. That's when I um, decide on how many arteries there are, how many veins there are, is there any complicating factor, are there lymph nodes, is there anything in the liver, or is there a secondary lesion that I need to see? Can MR be used instead? Yeah, if you're at a place where people read MR all the time. So again, um, our hospital happens to have a, a very strong MR section. That may not be true everywhere, but CT is a really good test, and I use only MR as a second choice test. So what about PET and kidney cancer? Dr. Rathmel and I were talking about that, and it's always been like, no, no, no. But now I think it's like soon, you know? And you're going to be hearing later on, I think, from a speaker specifically about that. Um, right now, we don't use it as a routine, okay? But I think pretty soon, things will be changing. But this is just a pa patient that I've treated, not I've treated, I've seen, who has vulvar cancer and metastatic disease to the left chest wall. And so uh, we, have the vulvar, we have the bladder here, actually. The vulvar cancer has been removed. These are the kidneys. And do you see how you're looking from the front now? So this is right, left, superior, inferior. And this would be under the arm, the axilla and the chest wall. So now the patient gets some therapy. And this looks better, but we have a new site in the spine. So PET-CT or any PET relies on a snapshot of glucose in your body. So if there's some place that's very active with blood and sugar, okay, which tends to be most cancers, it takes a snapshot of that location. And so that's really what you're uh, looking at. So PET is a nice whole body scan. It doesn't really focus on little pieces. And you also can't measure the size of a lesion. So sometimes we have to do two things or one thing one time and the CT the other time. But uh, PET is very useful for identifying. You can see those bright things. You could really see that. But you can't measure the size, which is also critical for making a decision. This is new technology. Dr. Rathbell and I will be publishing some work on this soon. And um, we happen to have a combination of a hybrid PET and MR scanner. So we're using the MR underneath in here. This is a normal kidney there. We saw some blood supply there. This kidney is obviously abnormal. It's much larger. This particular case has a tumor in it. And what we do is put the PET scan over it. So we always put PET scans over CT scans. That was how we started out, that you still couldn't measure things. The concept here is I can use this part of the scan to do all the accurate measurements and stuff. And then we can use this part of the scan to see which parts of the tumor are active. So we're trying now to put those two together. We have one of these machines. There's now, I don't know, 30 or something like that. I still don't know if it's going to be a clinical tool, but for certain people. For children, I use it all the time. There was a little book up there that said Wilms tumors, really at the beginning, that's a special cancer of children. It's a great tool, no radiation. So you have a child who's gonna live a long, long life from a Wilms tumor. You don't, want to rate, you don't want to radiate that child. So reading the scan, I try to tell the, your doctors what they want to know. 
how big the tumor is, where it is, how many there are, and sometimes patients have um, a familial story. Uh, the relationship to the arteries and veins and ureters, how many there are, where they come off, again, for the surgeons who are look, going to be looking through those little tubes. The presence or absence of enlarged lymph nodes, measure those and find them. And um, all distant disease, we're going to take a look at the liver and the bones and those kind of things. So it really is a big sort of shopping center list for that. So I just wanted to show you a couple pictures. This is one of the very first patients I saw 12 years ago when I came to UNC, 44 years old with a large mass. And we needed to do some good staging on this person. And we, I just got the right equipment for it at that time. So this is the normal kidney here. This is the right kidney. And this is the left. And that's a big tumor, right? So quite a good size. But hard to see where everything went. I knew where most of the vessels were, but I really wanted to see the pancreas and some other things over it. So here, this is when I told you I stacked them up together, all the pictures. And now we're looking from the front, OK? And I can see that actually this tumor is just in the upper half of the kidney. And I can see that this arrow points to a piece of the pancreas. So I can tell the surgeons it's right on it. So when you're going to go in there, watch out for the pancreatic tail. And I can say, oh, here, the adrenal gland, that's that little upside down Y thing, it's not involved. So these are sort of just different things. And over the years, I've learned, too, what people want to know. I don't use the, the ones from the side as much, but it's really critical for me to get the ones from the front. And how about what kind of cancer it is? Sometimes I can be helpful. Sometimes. So here, I know there's something wrong. If you pick, it, pick a kidney that's wrong, this looks like the good one. This looks like the abnormal kidney. Something's going on here. But it looks like there might be a little clot in there. And here's a more tumor, and I was deciding which kind of kidney cancer it was. There are certain you know, signals that I'm looking at. But the presence of the clot was what really made the difference for me. And that's where I saw it the best. So this is the big vein coming from the, the bad kidney. And there's the clot inside it. And that only happens with your standard renal cell carcinoma. There's another type of cancer called transitional cell carcinoma also occurs in the kidney, doesn't make clots. And then also, I wanted to tell like where the lymph node was. Oh, here it is. Look, it's at the lower pole of the kidney. This is where the big vessel is. And it looks like we can figure that out nicely. And this one is where we learned a little bit about, again, other things. Um, this time, the kidney was here. This one's a little bit smoother and denser, but I couldn't tell what cell type it is from looking that. I don't have that magic glasses. <laughs> All I can do is tell you where it is and kind of what it's going to be. But then, this is important stuff. How many vessels? So if you're going to have your kidney removed, that surgeon wants to know how many vessels and where are they. So usually, I mean, they're supposed to be one. 25% of patients have two. And most of the time, actually, they go to the superior, inferior poles, we call it, of the kidney. But these are all right in the middle. This is going to be a tough, if you're going to remove a tough part of it. And then while I was there, I found out they had a kidney stone on the right, which doesn't seem like a huge deal, but that was why they came in. Pain, you know, on one side. And then find this other thing on the other side. So another patient, remember uh, Dr. Kim was talking about dialysis patients who get cysts on their kidneys? This patient we did a CT scan on, and we had this thing. It looks kind of solid, kind of hard to tell. This is how we measure the density. 35 is about soft tissue. It's like, oh, might be. And then it needs to uh, assess what happens to it when we add contrast material. So now all of these dark things are cysts, but look at this thing. And when I measured it, it doubled in density. When you increase the density, it's a cancer. It's a tumor. And so I was able to find the one cyst that was problematic versus all the other ones. So that's also trying to help out on what to do next. And then just a couple other things that we can help out with. This is a, a cancer that's posteriorly high up here. Um, we do percutaneous therapy at our hospital where uh, what we do is 
put probes right here, hot probes, cold probes in, kill off the tumor. And there it is, dead. It's pretty good. The, uh, it's about 90% uh, rate of uh, cure with this type of tumor compared with the surgical approach. But we use this on particularly difficult cases, very obese patients, that sort of thing. And as I said with Dr. Um, Rathmel and her colleagues, we looked at some of these drugs that Dr. Kim was talking about, zinitinib and serafinib and those kind of things. And when the patients got this, um, this drug, it's kind of interesting, we've always used size as a very important indicator of whether the kidney's getting better or not, right? So this patient, this is their kidney with the tumor in it, and this is after they got the sunitinib. So there's all this dead tumor in there, but it's not very much decreased in size, even though there's been a really good response. So that's where radiology is changing. In this area, we have the um, same type of thing going on, but this guy is a non-responder, no real change in density or size non-responder. And this patient has plenty of tissue here, complete, very good response on this patient, very dark. So even though the size is the same, the density is different. And that may eventually come into staging. And uh, you saw this from Dr. Kim earlier. We had different types of tumors, and he showed you these different types of cells. Um, one of the things Dr. Rathmel and Dr. Kim work on is deciding which drug works for which cell type, because not everything is everybody. So uh, thank you so much for listening, and I'll be happy to talk with you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.